U.S.-Mexican border remains a historic and metaphorical divider of land and human beings. 1,950-mile-long open wound dividing a pueblo, a culture, running down the length of my body, staking fence rods in my flesh. Splits me, splits me, me raja, me raja. This is my home, this thin edge of barbed wire. It's like a scar between the two countries. The border is like a scar. And then somebody will open that scab and it will bleed again. Writers challenged ancient and living boundaries drawn by greed, by racism, by machismo, by intolerance. During the protest movements of the 60s and 70s, Mexican-American student leaders rejected the idea of Mexicans as recent immigrants. They called the southwestern United States Atzlan, an Indian word meaning homeland of the Aztecs, a concept that helped them recover their forgotten past. Aztlan is this mythical notion of a, an area from which the Mexicas came before they came into central Mexico. And in the 1960s and 70s, there was a rebirth of this sort of cultural nationalism. And so Aztlan, even though it's not clear where it is, and some people say it's just north of Mexico City, for Mexican Americans and people who identify themselves as Chicanos, they said Aztlan is in the U.S. Southwest. So claiming the land for themselves and saying this isn't, we're not interlopers on some Anglo land, but in fact, Anglos are interlopers on our land. The outside, the dominant cultures were telling us we were very foreign, we didn't belong here, or we were exiled. We didn't go to the U.S., the U.S. came to us, you know, and that's exactly what happened. The story of the borderlands is a story from a mestizo point of view from people born into mixed bloodlines and culture. It is a literature that gives voice to the disenfranchised, beginning with the Spanish conquest of the New World. Chicano and Chicano literature is American history. It's part of American history. But beyond that, it also talks about the, the underside in some sense, the dark side of American history. It's very important to reconceive American history, to include the whole Hispanic background that usually was ignored when most of us went to school. Um, you jump from Columbus to the British settlements. If you talked about the Spanish at all, it was always those bloodthirsty Spanish looking for gold. The Historia, meaning both history and story, were revisionist versions of the Spanish conquest, told by common soldiers like Bartolomé de las Casas, Garcilas de la Vega, Bernal Díaz del Castillo, and Cabeza de Vaca. They are stories told from the fringes by the disenfranchised. The Spanish-American legacy continues with writers Américo Paredes and Gloria Anseldúa, one writer's testimony defining and redefining borderlands, a place of conflict and new beginnings. All of the writers, Diaz del Castillo, Cabeza de Vaca, Paredes, and Anseldúa, are dealing with the broader borderland idea of cultures coming together, mixing, often violently, conflicting with one another, and there are different kinds of texts. The first two cases of the Spaniards, Diaz del Castillo and, and Cabeza de Vaca, they're coming from the perspective of conquistador, of the, the conqueror. For Anzaldú and Paredes, they're coming from the perspective of the conquered, in some sense, the, the, the Mexican-American who have been sort of marginalized by an Anglo-American dominated society. Driven by gold and religion, Hernán Cortés and his soldiers conquered Mexico at the beginning of the 16th century. 
When they first encountered the Aztecs, the Spaniards were in awe. A common soldier named Bernal Diaz del Castillo described their entrance into the capital city of Tenochtitlan, the city of Mexico. His account emphasized La Maravilla, the marvelous nature of the world they encountered. These great towns and temples and buildings rising from the water, all made of stone, seem like an unchanged vision from the tale of Amadis. Indeed, some of our soldiers ask whether it was not all a dream. Born in the momentous year of 1492, Bernal Diaz de Castillo joined the expedition of the conquistador Hernán Cortés in 1519. Late in his life, del Castillo wrote his monumental work, The True History of the Conquest of New Spain. He was a commoner who challenged the official history. I am now an old man, over 84 years of age, and have lost both sight and hearing. And unfortunately, I have gained no wealth to leave to my children and descendants, except this true story. By the time he's starting to write, which is in the 1560s, Bernal Diaz is an old man. And he isn't justifying what he just did. He doesn't want another job, because he's, we would call him a retired man. What he wants is um, that they, they need to send him his, his retirement check. Del Castillo's vivid account depicted the brutal path to victory and the blood that spilled on both sides of the conquest, Spanish blood as well as Aztec. We saw our comrades who had been captured in Cortes' defeat being dragged up to the steps to be sacrificed. The high priest laid them down on their backs, cutting open their chest, drew out their palpitating hearts which they offered to the idols before them. Bernal Diaz del Castillo was saying, I'm an eyewitness to this, I saw it, I was a witness to it, I participated, I was a soldier, I have the truth. Montezuma welcomed our captain and Cortes, speaking through Doña Marina, answered by wishing him very good health. One of del Castillo's greatest contributions to mestizo consciousness was his respectful treatment of the Indian slave girl he calls Doña Marina, born into an Indian family, a traditional enemy of the Aztecs. The girl was sold into slavery after her father died. She was presented by a defeated tribe as tribute to Hernán Cortés. Baptized with the name Doña Marina, she became translator and negotiator for Cortés as he gathered Indian allies against the Aztecs. Many blame her for delivering Mexico to the Spaniards. There's one interpretation, the sort of dominant Mexican machista interpretation of her is she's the, the malinchista, the sellout to the foreigners. She's, you know, of course, becomes Cortez's courtesan, had, um, has the first mestizo child with him, or that, so the myth goes. Um, so she's the sellout, sleeping with the enemy. Beginning with Del Castillo, writers have idolized Doña Marina, where to some indigenous peoples, she was known by a different name, La Melinche, the traitor. She has been a conflicted and contradictory symbol for almost 500 years. Another Spanish soldier, Alvar Núñez Cabeza de Vaca, became what some would call the first cultural mestizo, a man who straddled two worlds. My only remaining duty is to transmit what I saw and heard the nine years I wandered, lost and miserable over many remote lands. Cabeza de Vaca sailed for the New World in 1527 as part of a Spanish expedition to Florida. Shipwrecked and marooned, he wandered for years among the Indians before finding his way back to Spanish territory. In the case of Cabeza de Vaca, the text is especially interesting because it's probably one of the few cases we have of a European at that time being put in the position of the colonized. Cabeza de Vaca returned from the New World a failure in Spanish eyes. Appealing to the king, he wrote the story of his experience. 
His hard-fought knowledge of Indian peoples was valuable to Spain, he argued, and he should be compensated for his suffering. This is the appeal to pathos. That's what's really going on here. Look at me. You're going to judge me like you're judging these men who have been comfortable here. They bring all this money back to you. They perform. I was naked. Do you know what naked means? It means to lose your skin. I was reduced to hell. Cabeza de Vaca spent two years as a captive of Florida Indians. He escaped and fled north. Blending native practices with Christianity, de Vaca gained status among native peoples as a healer. Indian cultures became part of de Vaca's true story. They were all convinced we came from heaven. We passed from one strange tongue to another, but God, our Lord, always enabled each new people to understand us and we them. He learned their language and he interacted with them and he came to respect them and they came to respect him. There's a phrase in Spanish, el conquistador quedó conquistado, the conqueror uh, was conquered in the sense that he gained respect for the populations that he had come to conquer. As we went, we heard more and more of Christians. We told the natives we are going after those men to order them to stop killing, enslaving and dispossessing the Indians, which made our friends very glad. At the end of his journey, Cabeza de Vaca encountered Indians being ravaged and decimated by Spanish slavers. De Vaca was outraged. We hastened through a vast territory, which we found vacant. The inhabitants having fled to the mountains in fear of Christians, with heavy hearts, we looked out over the lavishly watered, fertile and beautiful land, now abandoned and burned, and the people thin and weak, scattering or hiding in fright. From the viewpoint of U.S. literature, it also is the first immigration text, the first slave text, the first transformation text, the first travel west text, so it's really the first one about this, this prototypical American adventure of bettering yourself through travel. So in a way he can be seen as a, a foundational character or figure for the Chicano population because he was in the Southwest. He did interact with the Native Americans and so he was in many respects the first uh, Chicano, first Hispanic American. The Spanish conquest devastated the indigenous population of Mexico. 25 million were reduced to under 7 million. By 1650, only one and a half million pure-blooded Indians remained. After years of slavery, disease, and genocide, conqueror and vanquished came together in a new race, a new mestizaje. The basic category of mestizo stuck, meaning mixed race. And that then, in the 19th and 20th centuries, as Mexico, as other Latin American nations are beginning to define their national identity, take up this idea of the mestizo identity, that we are not Spanish, neither are we wholly Indian, but we are this mixture and sort of a positive accentuation on that mixture. After the Mexican-American War of 1846 through 1848, the United States took California and the Southwest states. Denied their land rights, the Mexican-Americans who remained lived marginal lives under Anglo-colonialism. Along the Rio Grande, the locals sang the corridos, the border ballads, subversive songs of Mexican heroes who struggled against oppression. That literature, the Chicano and Chicano literature, is very sensitive, perceptive of that occupation, of that historical imperialism, which I think the Anglo-American literature tends not to be, it tends to forget. In the 1920s, the writer Américo Pérez began to collect corridos. His first book, with a pistol in his hand, is based on the ballad of Gregorio Cortez, a man falsely accused of killing a Texas sheriff. Borderlands peoples transformed the name Cortez from conqueror to oppressed tragic hero. 
familia la lleva en el corazón. To Pereres, the Anglos transformed the Rio Grande River, once a focus of life, into a barrier, artificially dividing families and friends. On both sides, people had shared the same traditions, legends, and songs. Pereres built a substantial archive of borderlands folklore. He's the first to approach, to broach uh, different aspects of Chicano culture and the conflict between the two cultures, the cultural clash between the two peoples, the Anglo-Saxons and the, and the Chicano people. Paredes' style of, of being interested in the folklore and the culture of Mexican-Americans as a way to get at that popular history is similar to Cabeza de Vaca's method in that Cabeza de Vaca was a sort of anthropologist before, you know, there was such a thing as an anthropologist going out to live amongst the people as a sort of participant observer. But the emphasis on folklore, on the culture of the people, and giving that importance is what connect the two of them. Emerico Pereres was born in Brownsville, Texas in 1915. His ancestors had settled the area in the 17th century when it was still a Spanish province. He was a young man in the 30s. He considered himself a border man. He lived in Brownsville so that Matamoros is right across the border. He also experienced the oppression and the prejudice and the discrimination of Texas. The 1930s was a difficult period for Mexican Americans. The United States government began deporting Mexicans, including many who were American citizens by birth. It was during this time, Américo Pérez wrote George Washington Gómez, a Mexican Texan novel, the story of a boy's coming of age in the borderlands. Consciously, he considered himself a Mexican. He was ashamed of the name his dead father had given him, George Washington Gómez. The Mexican national hymn brought tears to his eyes, and when he said we, he meant the Mexican people. But there was also George Washington Gomez, the American. He felt the pleasant warmth when he heard the Star Spangled Banner. It was he who discovered pirate treasure with Long John Silver and got lost in the cave with Tom Sawyer and Becky Thatcher. Of such matters were the basic cells in the honeycomb that made up his personality. And George Washington Gomez, we get the story of this new mestizo, if you will, uh, a young man who is born on this side of the Rio Bravo and uh, whose parents want him to be a leader of his people, want him to be the savior of his people, and name him George Washington Gomez. Emerico Perez died in 1999 at the age of 84. He left a legacy of poetry, songs, and stories that challenged the traditional divides, expanding the inclusiveness of the mestizo world. Américo Paderes, he had a great impact on a lot of Chicano writers. In the late 60s, Chicanas as well started to see themselves as oppressed, not just by race and class, but by gender. Women were often denied leadership roles within the Chicano student movement. Building on the work of Pereres and other writers, Gloria Anzaldúa, a Chicana and lesbian writer, further expanded the roles and identities of Chicanos. To rage and look upon you with contempt is to rage and be contemptuous of ourselves. We can no longer blame you nor disown the white parts the male parts, the pathological parts, the queer parts, the vulnerable parts. Here we are, weaponless, with open arms, with only our magic. Let's try it our way, the mestiza way, the chicana way, the woman way. By the end of the 60s, within the Chicano struggle, women are protesting. Um, the 70s, they begin publishing. They really burst forth in the 80s. Gloria's book is part of this, this bursting of energy that has been repressed by the patriarchal part of, of ethnicity and the patriarchal 
the mainstream that's picking the, the books up and publishing them. Suddenly there's this thrust. I call this whole thing the new tribalism because it's no long, we're no longer happy, satisfied, or limited to, you know, the little cubby holes that race has given us. We're all like blurring those racial categories. Writer Gloria Anzaldúa was born in 1942 in the Rio Grande River Valley, the borderlands of South Texas. Gloria Anzaldúa's 1987 book, Borderlands, La Frontera, examines social, geographical, and racial borders in American culture. Anzaldúa's work redefined the mestizaje as all people who live between worlds and gives them a voice. To live in the borderlands means you are neither Hispana, India, Negra, Española, ni Gabacha. Eres mestiza, mulata, half-breed, caught in the crossfire between camps while carrying all five races on your back, not knowing which side to turn to, run from. For me, trying to find myself reflected in, in the, the textbooks that I read in school, in, in the novels that I would pick up to read, and we were not in it. My reality was not in those books. So that was like my first interest in writing was to fill the gaps. She is telling us the true history as well. She is giving us a testimonio, if you will. Uh, she witnesses, she, uh, she too witnesses what has happened in the borderlands. And she's a witness to what has happened to a people whose history has been erased by people like uh, Bernal Diaz del Castillo. Chicana feminists placed the beginning of Chicana history at the year 1519, Spain's defeat of the Aztec Empire, and they transformed Doña Marina, or La Malenche, from traitor to heroine. They portrayed her as a powerful woman who worked on behalf of other Indian nations, other than the Aztecs. Symbolically, the slave girl became the mediator between languages, races, and cultures. Chicanos have said, well, who were her people? You know, she was given away when she was about seven years old to the Mayans, and the Mayans then gave her to, to Cortez. So who were her people? And who was she betraying? In redefining La Malinche, the Chicanos are redefining themselves also, and redefining themselves in their own, own terms to put the record straight. In rehabilitating La Malinche, Chicanas were creating a more inclusive picture of Mexican-American people, one that reflected a multiple consciousness, a mestizo consciousness. That idea of a mestizo consciousness is, is very alluring. The idea that you don't have to be one thing or the other, that you could bring together the various aspects of your heritage, your cultural experiences, and sort of form them yourself. Not only is that okay, but it in fact gives you a privileged position because you're able to see much more from these different perspectives. To live in the borderlands means knowing that the India in you, betrayed for 500 years, is no longer speaking to you. That Mexicanas call you rajetas. That denying the Anglo inside you is as bad as having denied the Indian or black. The writing is based on my experience, my life, that I then take that experience and reflect on it. And that's where the historia comes from. Historia is a Spanish word for history, but it's also the Spanish word for story. And so history is supposed to be the truth. And um, story is supposed to be made up. And I happen to think that everything is made up, that history is just as fictitious as the novel. I'm writing from the Mexican Chicano perspective language and the white dominant culture perspective language, but I'm writing from that in-between space that I call borderlands consciousness.
Mexican-American writers have challenged the entrenched Anglo definition of who qualifies as an American. They write from a hard-fought perspective and give voice to a complex and authentic American experience. The whole ethnic 60s and 70s has to be redone from a new point of view that, um, that the sexual revolution of the 60s has to go to its logical extreme, that people have to be valued in a different way that is not one consciousness, it's a multiplicity of consciousness of one person. And it's just, you happen to have one body, but it's all this multiple possibilities. This is just the fulfillment of the American dream. Using testimonio and historia, the mestizo voice emerged over centuries. The writings of Bernal Diaz del Castillo, Cabeza de Vaca, Américo Pérez, and Gloria Anzaldúa bear witness against the dominant culture's reading of history. These writers reclaimed geography and defined identity in the borderlands. Why this is important for U.S., for understanding U.S. history, is the, the people there, that interaction between Europeans and, and the indigenous, is what's important, how, how we came to be who we are. And so as much as we might like, the history has traditionally suppressed that story, that in fact is at the roots of, of our culture. It's, it's there in our, in our beliefs, whether the history has recorded it or not. So it's about the history recognizing what in fact has always been there. It's essential that not only ethnic minorities read this, but that the, the majority Anglo-American student be knowledgeable of this culture and realize that there are masterworks being written by these people. This program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.